see. Thank you very much, Rex, <laughs> for the introduction and thanks uh, to JGI for, for giving me the opportunity to present my lab's work. Um, so I want to jump right into, okay, two seconds delay, um, about the core problem that I want to address in my today's talk, and that is that the bulk approaches that are so widely used in the field today are absolutely essential to how we carry out science, but they are ultimately limited and they need to be complemented by other tools. So let's say you are interested in trying to understand the physiology, the function of a group of organisms or a particular taxon, a particular microbial ecosystem. Let's say you study this through the means of metagenomics or metatranscriptomics or metabolomics or all these other omics tools that we've heard so much about. The, these are extremely powerful approaches, but the main problem with these, as far as I see them, is that they're destructive in nature and they take a bulk sample, grind the shit out of it, and then take an average measurement of whatever you're interested in. You have transcriptional levels, the expression of a particular gene of interest and so on. And that in itself is extremely powerful, especially because a lot of these approaches can now be done in high throughput. So we can get a lot of data points. But the problem is that your implicit assumption in all of these analyses is that the underlying cell population actually is well represented by your average value that you're measuring. So there will be some cells that we're all aware of that might be very lowly active. So have a low expression level, for example, for a particular gene that you're interested in. Some might have a little bit of a higher, but your implicit assumption that the majority of the cells is somewhere around your average. It's a Gaussian distribution. And this is an untested hypothesis because you're applying a bulk approach. You do not know what the individual characteristics of the individual cells is. So I can make up a scenario in which there's a lot of cells that have a very low expression of your target gene. Some have a very high expression of your target gene and not a single cell in your entire ecosystem has that average value that you measure. And we can come up with different scenarios, obviously where, you know, what is statement would still be true that your average is still, you know, giving you an average answer. But the question becomes is like, is this actually relevant for the, on an organismic or an enzymatic level? So the way my lab tries to approach this problem is by developing what we call next generation physiology approaches. So these are single cell resolved approaches that are in its first instance, non-destructive to the cell. And you're measuring a particular phenotype that you're interested in that can be the expression of a pigment, the expression of a gene, whatever you're interested in within reason. Um, and because this analysis of this particular phenotype is non-destructive, you can still do something else to that cell. So for example, characterizing its genotype. So one of the core differences of how we try to approach these studies in the future is we turn the common approach of how these kind of analysis are done on its head. Typically it's genotype first, phenotype second. You generate a metagenome from a sample, you build a, a hypothesis about the metabolism, and then you do a wet lab experiment to address the phenotype. And we do it the exact opposite. We say we're gonna first study the phenotype and then later we worry about the genotype. And today I want to show you how we approach this problem, okay? So let's say you have a microbiome. In this particular case, this is a lake, a lake sample, but this can be pretty much any sample. The first thing you're gonna do is you probe the phenotype you're interested in. I, I give you different examples of what this phenotype could be. But overall, we can think about three kind of classes of phenotype probing. The first one is a label-free approach in which you try to characterize the phenotype you're interested in under non-invasive condition without doing anything to the sample. You literally just measure it under a microscope, for example, but you're not doing anything to it. You don't introduce a label or anything. So you could look for the presence of a carotenoid or the presence of uh, a carbon storage compound or whatever you're interested in that you can observe in some way without doing something to the cell. No staining, nothing. The other one is that you introduce a stable isotope label. So for example, applying a growth substrate that might be isotopically labeled. And the other one is what we call substrate analog probing to which I'll come to in my next slide. But the idea is that you try to look at the turnover of large biomolecules inside of the cell. And you do this by fluorescent staining approaches. You then observe this phenotype over different means. Usually this means some kind of optical microscopy setup or fluorescence microscopy setup, or arguably the most powerful one, Raman spectroscopy. And then after you observe the phenotype, you can, if you want to separate that cell through some means, we can discuss this, how we can do this, and then do something else to that cell. So for example, sequence its genome or do targeted marker gene amplification. So 6 ms RNA gene amplicon sequencing. 
to link the identity or the genotype of the cell to its original phenotype that you observe. So you first care about the phenotype and then you say, okay, who are you actually? But with that, you can easily link this on the same cell level because usually the identification of the genetic material you, it leads to the lysis of the cell. You cannot do a phenotype problem of the same cell anymore or cultivation of the cell or some other microscopy approaches. So the first one I want to talk about is the substrate analog probing approaches that um, now also the JGI has implemented in some form. This is the one that uh, Rex mentioned or somebody mentioned it before, um, this biorthogonal non-canonical amino acid tagging. So the whole idea of substrate analog probing is actually very simple, that we use a substrate analog. So this is a synthetic compound that doesn't occur in nature, but that is due to the inherent substrate promiscuity of the cellular machinery misrecognized by some enzymes and accidentally incorporated into biomolecules. So for example, synthetic nucleosides that are incorporated into RNA or DNA, synthetic D amino acids that are going into the bibidoglycan layer, synthetic fatty acids that go into the lipid membrane, synthetic sugars that are incorporated into sugar storage or the glycocalyx of bacteria, and synthetic L amino acids that go into proteins. And what all these have in common is they have an acide or alkyne moiety that is amenable to acide alkyne click chemistry, which is a very cheap, super easy to do, can teach a person in 15 minutes, very cheap to do fluorescent staining technique that then allows you to look for any cells in a sample that might be synthesizing new DNA or new RNA or new peptidoglycan or new membrane lipids. And the one that we focus on mostly today, uh, synthesizing new protein. And so because this is a simple fluorescence staining technique, you can couple this to any other fluorescence, uh, fluorescence microscopy technique that is available to you. So for example, you can couple it with uh, 16S RNA targeted fluorescence in situ hybridization and then link what the identity of the organism is that might you, you might be interested in and study whether over the time of the incubation, the presence of these substrates of a sample, they've engaged in protein synthesis in this example, or peptidoglycan synthesis, and provide a direct link between the phenotype, in this case, the cell is translating new protein, so it's translation reactive, and the, the identity of the cell. So phenotype first, phenotype second. So let's go about an example of what we can do with this. So let's say you have a sample, um, that you want to characterize in terms of, you know, what different microbes might be metabolizing. So which carbon substances they might be using, what are the temperature regimes they're adapted to, you name it. You take a sample incubated in the presence of this uh, synthetic L amino acid that is incorporated into a new protein instead of methionine. This compound is called HPG, homopropyl glycine. And the idea is that in each one of these incubations, you'll provide a different substrate, or you change the temperature, or you change the pH, or you add a trace metal that is not present in all the other incubations. And the idea is very simple, that under each conditions, different organisms will thrive, and different organisms will not thrive. We then stain with a fluorescence dye, the ones that are translationally active, put them into a fluorescence activated cell sorter. Here you have the cell population stained, but where the synthetic amino acid has not been added. So there's no fluorescence because there's nothing to stain. The sample where we provided this synthetic amino acid and the sample where we provided this synthetic amino acid and we also added a substrate. Doesn't matter what it was. This is just an example. And already in this facts plot, you see there's a difference in the cell population. And this is cells that have been active before, but now also cells that have been activated because of the presence of the growth substrate. And if you can now can identify what these organisms are and you compare these to samples, you can subtract the two and you know now which are the ones that have responded to your substrate. That doesn't mean that they are primary degraders of the substrate, right? It just means they react in some way to the substrate. But it's a good first step already. So if we combine this with 16S RNA gene sequencing, this is what you typically do, but you can also couple this with full-scale shotgun metagenomics, obviously, you can then learn what each ASV, each species, each OTU, whatever you want to call it, you know, is doing under each condition, right? And because you did this under many different conditions, you know now that species one is active in the presence of sugar. It is active under oxy conditions, but not under anoxy conditions. It really likes to have copper addition to the same and so on, right? You can build a profile about the physiology of this organism without any cultivation and with really short-term incubation that maybe take a day, 
and then you still need to run the facts, which takes a week. So that's the limiting factor really here, right? So the first time we showed that this is possible, we used this in a benchmarking study that was published by my graduate student, Nick Reichert, my first graduate student who actually graduated last year, um, um, in a benchmarking study that we did in a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. We simply chose this one because it's a model community. It is comparatively simple in its diversity. So you can keep track basically of the kind of organisms that are there, right? It's not soil. We're not gonna first apply this on soil. We're gonna try this on a micro community that's comparatively simple in which we can have genome sequences of all the organisms. And indeed, every single organism in this sample, about 150 different species, was active under one of 23 different conditions we provided. I'm only highlighting the two where we showed the strongest statistically significant change in all replicates compared to all other replicates of all other incubations. There was only two, because we were very strict and very conservative on how we interpret this data. And the idea is that, you know, here, see, you see the text that changed them translational profile the most in the presence of cellulobios and under anoxic conditions. So typically they grow under oxy conditions. Here they were incubated under anoxic conditions. And the idea is this was really more of a benchmarking study to see does this make sense? Can you actually do this? And one example for this is this Taumakiota, which turned out later to be obligate ammonia oxidizing archaea. So they use molecular oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. And indeed in the absence of oxygen, the activity profile goes down. This is exactly what you would expect. So since this first study, both Nick and other people in my lab have done this on other ecosystems with more biotechnologically relevant studies sites. So for example, during an internship at the JGI in Tanya Voikas group, um, between the two or three projects that Nick was handling on, he was, he, he, he was a workhorse, um, he was also working on trying to generate metagenomes from the same kind of incubation I just showed you, but where we particularly looked for cellulose degraders in yet another hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. He's currently preparing this manuscript. Okay. In another study, my former postdoc, Dr. Viola Krupenberg, used the same approach to look for microorganisms in hydrothermal sediment in uh, the deep sea Guaymas Basin to look for high molecular weight organic carbon degradation. Um, Rex, can you just move that window because I need to see that, thanks. Um, and then in another study, my former postdoc, Dr. Rachel Spitz, did a similar approach uh, using um, Little Sipper Wizard Salt Marsh, a model system in microbial ecology, just uh, a little bit north of Woods Hole, where the microbial um, diversity course is taking place to look for microbes that are degrading other types of high molecular weight organic carbon, Spartina seagrass and diesel fuel, to be precise. So this is the first thing you can do with these approaches, right? You can link the identity and the translational activity in this particular case of organisms at a single cell level, because we saw it individual cells. The other thing, as we said, we can do is we can correlate this or combine this with other microscopy approaches. So this is the other thing I wanna talk about today. So the first study I wanna talk about, we published already last year in which we teamed up with my uh, colleagues and friends, Pete Gerges at Harvard, his former postdoc, now he runs his own lab at Boston University, Jeff Marlowe, my former postdoc, Dr. Richard Spitz, and our friends and colleagues, Mark Ellisman and Christine Kim at UCSD, in which we tried to address the problem that the majority of correlative microscopy approaches are usually happening under ex situ conditions. You take a sample, bring it back to the lab, and then you throw all your fancy microscopy tools on it, which is super awesome and super powerful, don't get me wrong. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to do this under as close as possible in situ conditions and come up with a profile of how we can correlate microbial spatial structure and activity back to its natural ecosystem. So what we did is we went to Sipo Wizard Salt Marsh, just a little bit north of Woods Hole on Cape Cod, took sediment cores, like about 15 to 20 centimeters deep, brought them to a lab in Woods Hole. Julie Huber was nice enough to uh, volunteer her lab for that so that we, you could, you know, we only had a 20 minutes drive to Woods Hole basically. We then basically just replaced the water from the site with sterile filtered water from the site to which we added this synthetic amino acid. And to some, we also added different carbon sources. And then an hour and a half later, after they were out of the salt marsh, we put them back into the salt marsh and left them there for up to four days using gas permeable, but water impermeable membranes. Okay, so they could exchange gases with the surrounding sediment, but no liquid. So the cells couldn't leave, they were stuck in there, so to speak, right? I believe there's no better way of doing this if you want to do it in situ. I really don't think there's a better way of doing this. 
if somebody has a better idea of how you could do this, it, like I would be very happy to talk about because my whole spiel is I want to try to understand microbes in situ. This is so far the best I think we can do. And then we went back, retrieved the samples, embedded them in electron microscopy grade material and applied fluorescence microscopy, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, secondary electron microscopy, as well as in the separate samples, this bond cat fax approach I just showed you, which we identify the translationally active organisms. We did this in one centimeter increments. So we can tell you each species in this sediment core at one centimeter increments to what extent they're translationally active or not down a 10 centimeter sediment gradient. And we, we could in theory do this at like two millimeter resolution. It was simply not possible within the time frame of the project. But in theory, you can do that because you can section sediment at like you know a millimeter if you wanted to. This was good enough for what we had in mind. And so what you can then create is you can overlay all this information from fluorescence microscopy. Here we have the DAPI stained biomass in a particular section, the translationally active biomass by fluorescence microscopy, the secondarily electron microscopy, which gives us the overall pore space, because again, these were embedded in electron microscopy raisins. The mineral particles are pretty much in the same position that they were in the salt marsh in what the pore space is. And because we create elemental maps through energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, we get the mineralogi mineralogical identification of all the minerals in there. And we can now study to what extent biomasses, biomass organizes itself around these particles and whether or not there are differences in their translational activity. And we can do this mineralogically resolved because we know that this is a quartz particle and this is a feldspar particle. So by the end of the day, you can correlate spatial structure translational activity of said biomass, and in this particular case, mineralogy. In principle, I think you can apply this to pretty much any sample, not with pure water, obviously, um, within reason to a lot of different ecosystems, definitely soil and root systems, right, in which you have spatial structure, in which you want to understand how spatial structure and activity of microbes formulate themselves around abiotic and biotic surfaces. Okay. The last method I want to introduce you today, which is a criminally underrated technology, which in my opinion is the technique that has the most promise for microbiology in general, and it's criminally underrated is Raman microspectroscopy. So I don't have the time to go over the, all the physiological, excuse me, the physical effects that underlay Raman spectroscopy. But basically what you do is you take a sample, you shine monochromatic light on it. And what happens is that you start to uh, you stimulate the vibration of molecules. Okay, so molecules uh, absorb a light, uh, a photon, they start to vibrate a little bit faster, and after a while they go back into a vibrational ground state. And in a very rare number of events, 10 to the minus 6%, so one out of 100 million photons, it will not be regularly scattered, but it will be scattered um, by an effect that is called Stokes or anti Stokes scattering. And basically, what it means is that a molecule doesn't go back into its vibrational ground state, but is in a semi quasi hypothetical vibrational energy state. So basically it just doesn't fall back to its ground state. It has a little bit of a different energy content than it was originally when it absorbed the photon. Or a molecule that is already in a high energetic state absorbs when it then falls back into its ground state. So either way, the point being, right, there's a difference between the photon that is going out of the system versus the one that hit the molecule in the first place. And this is what is called the Raman shift. The difference in wavelength Excuse me, I, I always forget that there's a delay. <laughs> the difference in the uh, wavelengths of the light that is going out versus the one that's going in is called the Raman shift. And it turns out that this Raman shift is bond and chemical specific. So you can use this to identify the specific bonds and by extension, a particular chemicals that were present in a sample, you can use this to chemically map samples. And if you have this coupled to a microscope, and at the moment there's only this like six in the nation, one of the ones that I run at MSU, is you can do this on a micron scale level. So you can use this to chemically map the chemical composition of cells. So this is where we come back to this original approach that I talked to you before, where we said we can do this under label-free conditions. You can literally take a sample and put it under the microscope and shine a laser on it, basically. Within a second, you have the answer about the chemical composition of your sample. So in this case, this is from a, a cell, a single cell spectrum from a biofilm that we just 
pulled out of a hot spring at Yano School National Park just for the fun of it. Turned out this thing has a lot of cytochrome C, and another one that we pulled from the same biofilm has a lot of carotenoids. And we know that because there's particular peaks indicated here that as far as we know, no other molecule that we have ever found in the history of science has these peaks. This is a specific peaks for cytochrome C and specific peaks for this particular type of beta carotenoid. And we can do this because this is coupled to a microscope, right? We have a microscopic stage that can move around the laser and we can use this to chemically map a sample. So this is the first demonstration of this in 2013 by Marco Schmidt and Michi Wagner, who was my PhD advisor. We got the Raman microscope in our PhD lab just when I left his lab. When we basically started, they started mapping a sample of Petriotoa cells. So really large 50 micrometer big sulfur oxidizers. And they wanted to see, you know, do we see subcellular or cell to cell differences in cytochrome C content and the content of um, a garbage uh, storage compound called polyhydroxybutyrate. The point is not what they found here. The point is you can do this. You can do this under non-invasive condition in water, in gas, in a solid, it doesn't matter. So the other cool thing, right, is because this is a vibrational technique, you can actually determine whether or not stable isotope has been incorporated to your biomass. The idea behind this is very simple. I just show this here with a water molecule, which is obviously not what, we, what we're looking at in cells, but because you know, the incorporation of a heavy isotope or the substitution of a heavy isotope versus a light isotope changes the vibrational state of the molecule. If you go in with the same energy, because of the energy conservation principle, if there's a higher mass, you cannot, you know, you cannot stimulate the same type of vibration. The wavelength will be different. It will be a longer wavelength. And what we do in Raman spectroscopy in these plots I just showed you is simply plot one divided by the wavelength, which is the wave number. So you will see a peak shift between a cell that was grown only on C12 substrate versus one that has C13 or nitrogen 15 versus nitrogen 14 or deuterium, you, you get the idea. So this is an E. coli cell here in red that was grown in the presence of glucose, just off the shelf glucose, which has like about 1% background C13. The green one is an E. coli cell that was grown on C13 glucose. And you see that after one generation, so this is 20 minutes or so, you can do this much faster than this. Okay, this is a very sensitive technique. You see, there's a new peak occurring, which is consistent with the C13 hydrogen peak in phenylalanine specifically. And the red one is the one from C12 hydrogen. So you see that the peak of the green cell still has a peak of C13, excuse me, C12, because there's still a lot of C12 in the cell. But the green peak here, this 966 peak is absent in the red cell. And that is because it wasn't grown in C13. So what this means is you can use this approach to identify whether or not cells have taken up isotopically labeled growth substrates. So you can look at assimilatory processes. But because this is not enough, we wanted to combine this with pretty much everything that we could imagine. And so my really awesome graduate student, George Scheibel and Anthony Kotz, you should look out for him. He's, he's fantastic. He's probably one of the best people I've ever seen in science so far. He will graduate in about a year and he will not have a problem finding a postdoc. I'm just gonna say that. So, one thing we did over a FICUS proposal, I should have put the FICUS logo on here, I apologize. Uh, we teamed up with John Cliff, uh, the nanosims expert um, at EMSL, to come up with a protocol where we combined pretty much everything I just told you. Stable isotope probing, fluorescence in situ hybridization, Raman microspectroscopy, secondary electron microscopy, backscatter electron microscopy, energy dispersed factor spectroscopy, and nanosims. Everything on the same cell, everything on the same sample. So you take a sample from pretty much every environment, again, within reason, okay? But pretty much any structured environment is possible to do so. Again, pure water is hard to do because there's not a lot of structure unless you work with like aggregates. If you want to, you can apply a stable isotope label and then put it on a surface that is compatible with all the techniques you're gonna work on. There's different options. The one we settled on is simply stainless steel. That's just the easiest one we found. And then you image them with fluorescence microscopy, Raman spectroscopy, SEM, and then nanosims. But you can do it in a different order if you want to do so. And we can discuss later if you have any questions why you would do in one or the other particular order. Basically has to do with the preservation of the morphology of the cells. So we first did this on a mock community to see if we can actually do it. And I apologize, it's a little hard. It's just too bright in here, I guess. Also my eyes suck, so maybe it looks better for you guys. 
um, so this is a mock community out of E. coli and the methanogen methanosocyanus cedivorans that were grown in the presence or absence of heavy water, just as, as one example of an isotopic label. Water will isotopically exchange with the NADPH pool, and then the deuterium that we provide from the heavy water will go into the lipid membrane. So you basically look at lipid synthesis, basically. So here we identify them using fluorescence in situ hybridization. We take the Raman spectra. We show here the stacked spectra of 50 different cells. Here's the deuterium peak in E. coli. Here's the deuterium peak in methanosacina. And here's the population that was not active, E. coli methanosacina. We then do secondary electron microscopy to get the morphology. And after that, if you have access to nanosims like we have, you can also do a mapping of the chemical and isotopic composition of the sample at about 50 nanometer resolution. This is redundant. This gives you the same answer. This is just at 50 nanometer resolution, and this is at 250, 200, uh, 296 nanometer resolution. But the information in this case is identical. Okay? And we can then generate these beautiful maps that will come up in a second in which we basically simply project all this information to a single image. So a super correlated image in which we basically have the morphology of the cells or how they look like, the SEM picture. We false color code it with the identity of the cells as determined by 16S RNA targeted fish. And we simply outline whether they were active or not with a halo. That's just the, the, an easy way we found that this works. So the next step was to apply this to an environmental sample. We go back to Sipo Wizard Salt Marsh, which is one of our main study sites, as we mentioned before, in which my lab, specifically, this is the main part of the PhD thesis of my grad student, George Scheibler, has been studying these obligate multicellular bacteria. So these bacteria are the only known example that we know of for obligate multicellularity in bacteria. There's no single cell stage. They grow by simply growing an aggregate in size and splitting it in two, like an early embryo stage. This is super cool biology and I have no time to go over this. Okay, I'm happy to talk about it later. But so what is also cool about these organisms is that they're magnetotactic. So they have magnetosome crystals that are composed either of magnetite or grygite. So Fe3 or 4, Fe3S4 that we can also image with our tools. And so we did the same, we did the same approach I just showed you before. And I'm just gonna show you the final image as we you know, put it all together in which we have different populations of these multicellular aggregates. Each one of these balls is composed of somewhere between 30 and 60 cells, depends on the species. And it turns out we have five different species in the sample. We know that because together with the JGI, we sequenced the genomes of 23 individual aggregates, but also of the metagenome of the site. We designed fish probes that look at the most abundant ones in the sample. And we then correlate again the identity, the activity, and so on. And in this case, you don't see any halos because it would be redundant because every single aggregate in this case was active. So we decided to not label them anything because everything would have a white halo. But they all were translate uh, to not translationally active, they were anabolically active under the conditions provided. But as we said, we could also combine it with other microscopy tools. So for example, here's an image of a multicellular magnetotactic bacterium as imaged by SEM. By backscatter electron microscopy, it is super hard to see, but you see if you squint a little bit, or for me, I need to squint both eyes, white chains. These are these uh, very uh, magnetic crystals inside of the cells that they use for orientation in Earth's magnetic field, which we can also study with Raman spectroscopy. Excuse me, this is, a, excuse me, this is the chemical map from X ray spectroscopy. And with Raman, we can identify what the mineral species is. Because grygite and magnetite both have specific peaks, turns out that this particular one is grygite. And this is confirmed also with nanosims analysis, where we get a, you know, a much better resolution of the individual crystals inside of the cells. So the point being, if you want to, and if you do the right preparation of your sample, you can throw all these tools on the same sample and get everything that you want. And separately, you create the genome that you can then inform to design your fish probes, for example. So in my last 50 seconds I have, I have one slide left, it's perfect. I want to show that, uh, so historically, this was all funded mainly through a combination of NSF, the Moore Foundation, we, which was very generous to my lab when I started my lab. But now we've moved on to try to apply this to samples that are a little bit more medically relevant. So we recently got funding from the NIH um, to apply this to uh, colonoscopy samples. I am a very big critic of how human microbiome research is done, mainly because basically everything is fecal samples, which are basically irrelevant of how microbes live in the gut. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to do colonoscopy samples and apply all these techniques that I just showed you and develop new microscopy techniques for these correlative microscopy approaches to look at colonoscopy samples that we be provided by my collaborators and friends, uh, Laura Pace and James Hemp at the Metrodora Institute. And with that, I thank all the people who fund my lab, the JGI, for their support over the years with both CSPs and FICOS grants that uh, supported part of this work I showed you. And I'm going to leave up this slide to show we do a lot more than just method development. Thank you very much. Excellent job. Thank you, Roland. So I told you all he has a lot of cool tools and amazing approaches. Do we have any questions for Roland? Thanks, great talk. Really interesting method development and, and really cool tools with the, the Raman, especially. Um, speaking of combining tools, though, do you envision a, a way of doing Raman activated cell sorting? So yes, combining so the bond methods? We have methods? funding from the NSF to build a Raman activated cell sorter. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah, it, it's much harder than we thought. So it, a, 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 a technique is already available. Um, the problem is that regular Raman is notoriously slow. So the current record is 500 cells per hour. We are shooting for 1,000 cells per second. Wait, how long does it take per cell right now? Uh, I can't tell you because it's patented. Cool. <laughs> so, yeah. So, we're undergoing patent approval. So, but yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions out there? Great talk. Um, so. You mentioned this very briefly when you were talking about um, the difference between something being anabolically active and catabolically active. Uh -huh. um, so it's really interesting, right? When you show these these images at the cellular level, and some are active, right? And I, in most cases, like you're saying here, you're looking at anabolic activity. What do you have? You started to explore if the other ones are catabolically active. What what's the state of the art there? Is it redox sensor green? Is there something better? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of redox sensor green. Um, you can read all about this in my rant in a Nature Reviews article I wrote a few years ago. Um, I think the best way to look at catabolic active organisms is actually using the substrate analog probing approaches, I believe. So they still are targeting anabolism technically, but you, in, in the way I showed you, right, you can couple this. If you design the experiment in the right way, you can still look at catabolism rather than just anabolism. So the, the main problem Right with the stabilizer to probing and Raman approaches, which are super powerful, but you basically just look at buildup of new biomass. And the question basically is, right, what if the cell is active but it's not building up new biomass? If I understand this correctly, the only way to circumvent this is to come up with a really clever experimental design, I think, and do indirect labeling in which you look at general rather than biomolecule specific activity. So redox sensor green is very powerful in that regard, for example. It doesn't work for every organism on the planet, right? But the really cool thing about this is you'd basically just look for redox activity. There are similar probes available that fall in this category of what we call substrate analogs. Um, and there's also what is called um, activity-based protein profiling approaches that were pioneered by Aaron Wright at, uh, at PNNL that are basically full, they are basically a subcategory of the substrate analog probing approaches. And in the slide I showed you, there's actually examples for these approaches because you can do this at single cell level. Actually, Aaron has published a couple of years ago a first paper where they actually did combine the activity-based protein profiling approaches with fluorescence activated cell sorting and genome sequencing. You can, you can do this. It's just, I, I'm aware of like two papers. It's, it's, very, it's, it's not easy to do at the moment at least, or not widely used. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Roland. Appreciate the talk.